everybody, this is Pastor Martin Phelps again. It's so good to see you. I know I physically can't see you, but spiritually I'm there with you. And it's just wonderful that when you are communicating to each other in Christ, there's always that spiritual connection. There's always that spiritual understanding of each other. And the closer you get to God, you even have understandings of what people are going through at times, because that's how God leads you <clears throat> to pray for people. And so many of you I've been praying for, and... Um, Hopefully, well, I believe we've seen results, many results, just by our prayers one for another. The Bible says pray one for another. You don't have to be in the same room to do that. <clears throat> you don't have to lay hands on someone to do that. You don't have to be next to them. <clears throat> you don't even have to be two meters from them. You can be uh, a thousand miles from each other. So praise God for that. <clears throat> we appreciate you all watching. And thanks so much that every single week we're just growing and people are getting touched. And as I said to you last week, my main desire is just for God's Word to get out because it's the same amount of work for all of the people behind the scenes that help me. And uh, it's the same amount of work, whatever you do, to get to people. So you might as well get to a lot of people at, this, at one time. And I believe as the end times come, God's going to allow us, not just myself, but many people around the world, to touch multiplicities of people around the world. The Bible says in Isaiah 60 that the glory of the Lord has risen. Isaiah is prophesying and saying the glory of the Lord will will rise and multitudes will come to his rising. The glory of the Lord will rise up and then multitudes will come because of that rising to see the glory of the Lord. And it says about multiplicities of people <coughs> coming into the kingdom of God. So that day is going to happen. It's going to happen before Jesus comes back and it's a day to remember and a day to get excited about it. And I just felt God say to me as I was sitting there with you right now <coughs> that um, you don't have to be concerned about what's going on around about us. Always remember... <coughs> Excuse me. Always remember that God is on top and that God's hand is upon us and that God will never leave us or forsake us and that God allows certain things to ultimately increase his kingdom. God allows certain things to happen in the world. Even though we pray so much, we might think, why is that happening? Why is this happening? But I believe because in the future, people are not going to be the same. Many people have hardened their hearts to God and so people are not going to be the same. They're going to be different. And people are going to be open when preachers preach. They're not just going to close their doors. And preachers around the world and teachers around the world and individuals around the world are going to be given platforms of opportunity to minister the word in situations they never even dreamed possible. In governments, with ministers, politicians, right down to uh, you know, any, any place they might be in, to groups of people, wherever they are, to, right across the spectrum, they will be released to teach and preach and God's word will not return void. Because always remember this, <clears throat> that there's a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. And God doesn't want us to go to hell, and God wants people to change, and God loves people so much that his mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. And God doesn't anger as quick as you and I do. God is slow to anger. God <clears throat> is full of mercy, and is full of goodness, and full of grace. And I just want to say to you that, I was just thinking this morning about how hard people can get, and I was with a group of people um, in a place that is a, a few years ago. And this one lady just out of the blue in front of a whole lot of people just said to me, and what may I say you are doing here? Why are you here preaching God? <clears throat> Nobody believes in God anymore. Nobody cares about God anymore. I suggest you go somewhere else to preach in God. They don't want to believe in God in this place. We don't need God anymore. And I just stayed silent and I said, you're absolutely right. And I smiled and everybody stared at me because she was wanting to bring conflict. And you know, we never, we never uh, respond in conflict. We never respond with anger. We respond with love. And I said, you're absolutely right. They don't want to hear about God until 10 minutes before they die. Then they're very interested in hearing about God. And what God's doing, metaphorically, is he's changing the world's hearts so that one day when someone hears about Christ, they'll remember this whole time of this virus and they'll think, you know what? I'm not immortal. I'm a mortal human being. And I'm a human being that one day is going to die whether I like it or not. In fact, many people that I know have died from, from, from the virus and other, other ailments and so on. And so they will be totally open to knowing God and they will receive Christ. And so through this, what Satan meant for evil, this isn't God that did this, but God will turn it for his good. It's been hard for all of us. But what do we do? We just knuckle in there and we get closer to God. We just allow ourselves to put our arms around God. In Deuteronomy, the Bible says, cleave unto me. 
And that word cleave is derivative of the same word that God uses when a husband and a wife cleave unto each other. <clears throat> he's not talking about cleave as in sexually. He's talking about cleave as in hold on to each other. Be secure with one another. Trust in one another. Make sure you put your arms around each other, metaphorically, and stay close. And so we desire to cleave unto God, and we desire to get to know God better than we've ever got to know Him before. So I just want you to remember that because it's so important this morning to realize that there is a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. There's a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. And the only time we have to make that decision is on this earth. Once we leave this earth, we firstly can't make the decision for ourselves and we can't make it for anybody else. So it's, um, just remember to subscribe. Also, if you wouldn't mind, just liking the video. Praise God, we now have podcasts. Click on the link below to download any of the past episodes. And there's going to be a new episode every week. And then you can listen any single time you want. Thanks so much for being a blessing to me. And uh, I'm going to talk this morning on uh, fasting a little bit. In fact, it might even go to two weeks. It's so, it's so important. Please just watch. Because although it's not an easy subject to preach on, it's not something, it's not a glorious subject as in finance and uh, excitement and joy and so on. If you listen to what I'm saying to you to do and you do this, you will come out of this a stronger person than ever before. And you will come out of this much more powerful than ever before. Like I, talk about, I, said, I said, fasting is a must. Fasting brings power on our lives. What fasting does is it brings power against Satan because Satan is doing everything he can now <clears throat> to resist us walking with God. He's doing everything he can in these end times to stop our walk with God, to stop us maximizing who we are in Christ, to, to stop us reaching our potential, to stop us doing anything we can. He'll do anything in the world. He'll <clears throat> do anything he can to make us worldly famous or whatever, we, which is that's fine. There's no problems in that. But <clears throat> trying to prevent us from listening to God and trying to prevent us from walking with God, from praying, from, from, from walking onto a greater level, from increasing line by line, step by step. Remember I said last week, praying in the Holy Ghost, all these things I was talking about, and moving forward with him to stay close to him. Satan's trying to bring a wedge between us and God. And it's because he knows in these end times we're going to have more anointing than ever before. We're going to have more power than ever before, more glory than ever before. And when you understand that in your own individual right, you, number one, won't want to be like someone else because you'll experience God's glory in your own life. Even if, you know, if, if you, for instance, if you're a businessman or a businesswoman right now, God might, God wants to get you to a place where that glory and that anointing increases upon you. That financially, you're going to make so much money because you're going to be such a blessing. And God's glory will come on you in that way and use you to touch the world financially because the gospel cannot go out. Whatever you do, it, although the gospel is for free, preaching it costs money. And so, but God can use you in any area you're called to, to maximize your potential. Satan, on the other hand, wants to thwart that. He wants to hinder you from walking with God. He wants to hinder you. And so we need every single, uh, uh, we need every bit of weaponry at our disposal to, to walk with God so we can increase that anointing. Now, God, fasting gives you power. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. You might say, I've heard this before, but listen to what I'm going to say to you. Because fa fasting gives you power to thwart Satan and gives you power to increase in the anointing with you and God. It's an incredible, uh, uh, it's an incredible power that God's given us and with potential that I see very few people on this earth do. Of course, there's people spasmodically that fast and so on. And I'll talk to you about it. And at the end, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how to fast. <clears throat> and that might even be next week because I believe I don't want to rush. I don't want to talk too quickly. Sometimes when you're doing this, you, you just feel you've got to get it all over at one shot but I just want to take my time and I want to teach you. But if you just go to Luke chapter 4, verse 1. <clears throat> Luke chapter 4, if you wouldn't mind, verse 1. <clears throat> it says, Luke chapter 4, verse 1, And Jesus, whenever it's Jesus, I want to hear what he has to say, being full of the Holy Ghost. Notice here, he was baptized in the Holy Ghost <clears throat> in Jordan uh, by, by, by John the Baptist. And uh, John the Baptist is an example of <clears throat> a man that obeyed God. Is a, he was a man that did what God told him to do. He was a man that was fundamentally lived by himself. He ate by himself, lived by himself, but did God's work. And uh, in the natural, didn't look like some great Bible figure. And yet he obeyed God 
uh, baptized Jesus, and, and, and Jesus said he's the greatest prophet that ever lived. What we see as being great, just because someone stands in front of thousands of people, or someone has a lot of money and, and gives to the kingdom of God, or someone's on the platform and always in the front, and someone's always got those type of ministries, what I call open ministries, uh, uh, in front of people, there's other people that have got hidden ministries. You might just be praying every day. You might <clears throat> just be going to visit people right now in this, uh, in this virus that we're get, having. You might be helping the old people. Whatever you're doing, whether it's a hidden ministry or not, in Jesus' eyes, you're great for being who you are. I want you this morning just to relax and, and, and become who you are called to become. I, uh, <clears throat> I was never called to become anything other than, than, than I'm doing. And, and if I was, I wouldn't be doing this. Because it's hard enough when you, if you really are called of God, you won't really want to do it because you know how serious it is. But on the other hand, when you are called of him, you have to obey him. Because if you don't obey him, <clears throat> there's serious consequences if we don't obey what God tells us to do. And so uh, we need to take things seriously in the kingdom of God because when we take things seriously, that brings humility on us. And when we have humility on our lives, humility always brings authority. Uh, everybody thinks that being proud and arrogant and so on gives you authority, but actually humility gives you authority. You don't need to be in the limelight every second with everybody seeing you every, every single day, <clears throat> telling the whole world how great you are. What you need to be doing is just seeking God and letting him take the glory and letting him walk with you. Uh, and even when they said to Jesus, who, who took the world by surprise, was the greatest man that ever lived, when they said, uh, you're great, he said, there's only one that's great, and that's my father. And so... Uh, the most important thing is walk in humility and then Jesus will give you authority. Humility also brings promotion. Promotion comes, the Bible says, not from the east or from the south or from the west. Promotion comes from the north. Well, what he's doing is he's metaphorically saying there it comes from him. The Bible talks about uh, the angels in the north and talks about God being in the north and talks about uh, you know many times where uh, heaven is in the north and so on. But in reality what God's saying is seek me first, put me first. Put me first and I'll promote you. I will promote you. If you do what I tell you to do, I'll promote you. I will bless you. I will look after you and just honor me. And so what the first thing we need to do here, if you notice this, and take a heed of what I'm saying, in these end times now, we need to be full of the Holy Ghost. Now, of course, I spoke about it last week, praying and, praying and so on in other tongues and all these things, getting close to God. But much more than that, we need to make our lives conform to the Holy Ghost. We need to take up our cross daily and follow Him. Do things many times that we don't want to do, but take up our cross and follow Him and do what He tells you to do. And let Him and His anointing come upon you and be a blessing to His kingdom and allow yourself to get closer to Him. You'll feel it on the inside. Of you. Something on the inside of you is just telling you uh, to get closer to Him. Uh, like just right now, just something on the inside of me. See, just as I said that to you, something on the inside of me said that uh, I felt God say to me, you'll never be full of the Holy Ghost if you can't cope with that which is unfair. <clears throat> you'll never be full of the Holy Ghost if you can't cope with that which is unfair. Because many people don't like it when, pe when things are unfair and they fall away from God. The closer you get to the Holy Ghost, it's go life is going to be in many ways unfair doesn't mean God's not going to bless you and so on, but it'll be unfair. People will be unfair to you. People will say unfair things about you. People will commit, talk about you. People will try and hurt you. But you just need to cope with that which is unfair and just keep on walking with God. You're never going to get closer to the Holy Ghost unless you allow yourself to be in a place where you say, God, I will be, cope with that which is unfair. And when anything's unfair around me, I will just handle it. I will just walk in love. I won't allow it to get to me. I won't allow it to bruise my bones. I will just keep on walking forward with God. And so Jesus was, Jesus was the greatest man that ever lived and that had so many unfair things happen to him. And, uh, and yet he had the greatest power. But Jesus was very wise and the Holy Ghost uh, led him, Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost. Well, you know, I heard the other day that a man say, yeah, he, he's just an unkind man. You know, don't watch these unkind people on YouTube and all these places or whatever that say things. Uh, you don't need to have terrible negative things put in you. Just look, uh, focus on kind people, people that are preaching God's word. But he's an unkind man. He said Jesus was divine on this earth. He said Jesus were, you, you know, wasn't like us, and so that's why he was able to do what he did. And we can't do the works he did because we're never going to be like him because he was divine. Well, of course, he was divine in the sense that he was the son of God. But the Bible talks about him being the son of man. 
Bible talks about him giving himself of no repute. In Philippians, it talks about he gave himself up of no repute and became a man. <clears throat> Otherwise, the cross would have had uh, would, have, would, would have been futile. The, the, the cross would have been null and, for, null and void because he, if he died as God then, and the cross meant nothing to him and he didn't feel any human pain, what was the use of the cross? But here it says Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost. Notice he was baptized by, in the Jordan by, in the Holy Ghost. He was baptized uh, by uh, uh, John the Baptist. Why did he need to get baptized if he was the Son of God walking on this earth? And then it says here, when he got full of the Holy Ghost, things began to happen. He needed the Holy Ghost. Now, the Holy Ghost, Jesus and the Father are equal, but on this earth, he gave, made himself of no repute. So he walked this earth exactly like you and I. That's why the Bible says he was tested with sin. You can't be tested with sin if, if, if you're God. But the Bible says he was because God allowed himself to go through that so he could feel everything we feel and still give himself 100% to the Father. That makes me feel much better. Of course, people say, uh, you know, well, the Bible says we're kings and we're priests and so on and, uh, and, and all this. And people, what, how can we be equal to Jesus? Well, we're never going to be equal to him. But what God's saying is, is you're going to be my son forever. I'm going to love you as one of my sons. I'm going to love you my, like my son Jesus. I'm going to love you as my children forever. I don't understand that <clears throat> but because, you know, the scriptures always, cons I always think about these things. I spend hours and hours and hours where I'm thinking about these things, letting my, my spirit meditate on these things uh, and thinking about things that happen in my life, I, I, I think to myself, God, uh, what is man that thou art mindful of him? What is man? How, how are you so concerned about man? And the amazing thing is I don't understand it, but I just see his goodness and his kindness and every single day just little things he does that are, uh, just make me feel so happy and so joyful that he's so close to me. And... Uh, the, re the, the closer you get to the Holy Ghost, the less you'll worry about what man says about you or worried about what man says positively or negatively. If man speaks positively of you, beware because they'll be speaking negatively of you in a very short period of time. I'm not saying encouraging you and being kind. I don't mean that. But if they're constantly lapping, 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 lapping you, then what happens in the end is if they get too close to you and there's too much of a connection, well, they can hurt you. So... Uh, we, we need to love people. We need to be kind to people. We need to be godly to people. But we need to constantly look at the Father God and look at Jesus and let yourself be so full of the Holy Ghost that that's all in a way you need. Of course, we need each other. We need fellowship. But literally, God himself fulfills your life. And it says he returned from Jordan and was led. Notice, notice being led. When you're full of the Holy Ghost, you're led. When you're full of the Holy Ghost, you're led. Well, you might say, I don't need to be led. Well, you'll lead yourself down the wrong tracks. Uh, you know, for instance, some people are flying at 100, they're flying at 100 miles an hour. The Lord spoke to me one day. I was standing and over, overlooking a railway line. And as I stood there, I saw all these trains and they were going at fast speeds. And then the Lord said to me, many people fly at high speeds in their life, looking like they're performing so many good functions, looking like they're in my perfect world. But he said, you know what? Uh, your train's going a lot slower, but at least you're on the right tracks. They're on these trains going at 100 miles an hour. They're on the wrong tracks. He said, it's much more important. Go slower and stay on the right tracks. And he said, the way to do that is to be led by me. Well, the first thing you need to do is to be full of him, and then you can get led by him. And it says, led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Jesus was led into the wilderness. It's good to be in the wilderness. It's very good to be close to people. Um, uh, there's a lot of people in my life I've been very close to. But no matter who those people are, uh, even my flesh and blood, no matter who they are, I make sure <clears throat> that I've got time in the wilderness with my Father God. I make sure I've got time in the wilderness to talk to Him, to communicate with Him, so that He can help me, because if I do that, then everything else will resolve in, uh, itself, and I'll have time for fellowship with all these people around me, and with my flesh and blood and so on. <clears throat> but uh, I need to spend time in the wilderness. Well, just to add something to that, of course, people take it literally. So that's why monasteries started, <clears throat> because monasteries came from um, people thinking that in the, they must stay in the wilderness. And I'm not criticizing anybody with monasteries. They're great places to go to, to relax, to meditate in God and to have peace. But Jesus did that for a reason, so he could come out of the wilderness and face the world. Then it says he was being 40 days tempted of the devil. You know, everybody says after 40 days the the, the devil came to tempt him. Yes, he did. But during the 40 days, the devil t tried to tempt him. So what did Jesus do? Jesus used an ammunition of prayer and fasting. Jesus used ammunition of prayer and fasting. 
Now, I'm going to talk about prayer a little bit in a few weeks' time, so I'm not talking about prayer at the moment. I know we know a lot about prayer. But fasting here, he used the, the ammunition of fasting against the devil. And uh, uh, he knew that in his ministry, the devil did not want him to, to fulfill God's will because he knew that the, uh, uh, that the devil would know that that would be the end for him and for the devil because once Jesus died, then that would be a, a, a clock ticking, so to speak, <clears throat> to the end of time for Satan and when he would be put into the bottomless pit, which, of course, it has been. But um, it says, 40 days tempted the devil, and it says, in those days he did eat nothing. Now, I'm not talking to you to fast for 40 days. Some people just go literally. Um, you know, there's only three people in the Bible that fast for 40 days. That was Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. And all of them <clears throat> were led by the Spirit to do so. But we do need to fast. We do need to fast. And the reasons we do need to fast, if you think about it, that uh, we have all these desires and obsessions and situations that try and overtake us. Well, food, apart from, of course, sleep, but when you're sleeping, you're sleeping. You're not really <clears throat> you're knowing what's going on. But when you're awake, the greatest desire you have is to eat. So what God says, if you can submit yourself down to that uh, and, and not eat <clears throat> for certain periods of time or diminish that, then you can put your flesh and your body under. Of course, we fast with other things. But basic, mainly he's talking about here food. And when you, can, when you can die to that desire every day uh, and, 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 and pl place yourself in a position of allowing yourself to be dominant over food, then you can be dominant over anything in your life. And so God orchestrated this that it gives you power. So it says, uh, and in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, <clears throat> he afterwards hungered. He afterwards, he afterwards was hungry. Well, uh, what was God doing here? He was doing two things for Jesus. He was giving him power against Satan, but also power to do the signs and wonders and miracles on this earth and allow himself, as with his human nature, Jesus Christ, to give him an anointing to be able to withstand what he had to stand on this earth, but also an anointing to go and do the signs and wonders and miracles that he did. The Bible says if we were to write them all down, we wouldn't even be able to put them in all the books of the world. So what you see is just a fraction. It's just a fraction of what Jesus actually did on this earth. Well, these 40, these 40 days of fasting and praying set him up for the next three years. And so uh, when they were ended, he afterwards hungered. So number one is discipline here, is that when you fast, it brings discipline to you. And, 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 and you feel good because it's like giving finance away. When you give finance away and you give your tithes and offerings and honor God, into your local church and whatever, you, 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 you feel good because you've given something away. Here you've given of yourself to Christ. You've died to that desire to eat. And what you've done is you've felt yourself drawn closer to God. And the benefits here are phenomenal. And like I said to you, it's going to take me a couple of weeks to get to finish with this. But it says he was hungry. Well, the second thing it gives you, like I said early on, is power. It gives you power because not only does it give you power against Satan and all his cohorts and all the spiritual wickedness in the heavenies and the root of darknesses of this world and the principalities and powers and every demon that exists on this earth and every level of Satan. It gives you power over them. Satan in himself is extremely powerful still, but in the name of Jesus and with the power of God on the inside of us, we defeat him every single time. Not only does it give you greater power in that area of fasting, but it gives you great power. It gives you great power to do the works of Christ. It gives you power in your business. It gives you power in, in, in situations around you. It gives you power for your prayers to perform in a greater way. It gives you power uh, uh, to see manifestations of prayer like you've never seen. It gives you power to walk on a higher level with God. All of a sudden, there's great power upon you. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Old Testament version is Samson, that was the strongest man that ever lived, killed 3,000 people at one time. Uh, strongest man that ever lived. But spiritually speaking, you almost become like a Samson. You just become full of anointing and power. And that anointing will help and bless other people as well as your own life and as well as the situations around you. And all of a sudden you'll find around you and see around you the power of God working for you. Just the virtuous power of God in such an amazing way will just be working for you because God is on your side. He's with you, for you, and in you. And he wants to manifest himself. And God is alive in so many people around the world, but he's not manifesting himself. People say, well, I don't, I don't want to, I'm not really interested in serving him or going to church or getting to know more about him. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I couldn't care less. Well, you know, if you're not interested, he'll just leave you alone. Like I said to you before, he's a perfect gentleman and uh, uh, he's, he, he'll, he'll respond to you. 
Bible says, call unto him and he'll call unto you. Call unto him, pursue him and he'll pursue you. But Jesus then did those 40 days, that fasting and praying, I'm absolutely positive, allowed Jesus to do the work on this earth. He wouldn't have had the strength to do what he did on this earth had he not had that 40 days of prayer and fasting. Now let's just quickly go here, if you wouldn't mind, to Matthew chapter 17, verse 1. If you could just go with me to Matthew chapter 17, verse 1. <clears throat> it says here, uh, sorry, Matthew chapter 17, verse 14. It says, And when they were come to the multitude, there came a certain man kneeling to him and saying, this is Jesus, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's a lunatic. Well, you know how terrible it must be for a father to see a son as a lunatic. <clears throat> he knew that this was the outside forces that were doing this. He knew his son was just, wasn't just going crazy just because he felt like going crazy. He knew that something was trying to, to oppress his son. And it says, here, and, and he's sore vexed for often times. In other words, he's, he's in terrible pain uh, all the time. And oftentimes he falls into the fire. Well, if your son's falling into the fire, he certainly doesn't push himself in just because he feels like it. Some outside force is pushing him. So here Satan was at work to try to, and had got a hold of his son. So the power of Satan was on his son, trying to destroy his son. But thank God this man heard about Jesus. Thank God in the years ahead they're going to hear about you and they're going to come to you and ask you to pray for them. Thank God they're going to hear about you and ask, them, ask you to be set free. Um, you know, I, I remember, the, uh, God's just told me to slow down on this and just go through what I have to go. But I, I, I remember when I saw this, um, th this power, uh, I, I remember a friend of my mother's, she got born again, gloriously born again, um, right back in 1975. Well, she started going to church and so on uh, and committed herself just a few years before I started committing myself. And, and then um, she went to, she met a lady. Uh, uh, I remember her name now, but I'm not going to say it over YouTube. Uh, but she met a lady that was uh, also almost possessed by evil. And so the lady, uh, she used to be in a, a sort of coven and so on, and witches and all this, and Satan got a hold of her and tried to destroy her life, and terrible things happened to her, and she wanted to come out of that. So my mother ministered to her and so on, and she... She, uh, she got really uh, on fire for God. She came to church. Uh, the f revival was coming and it was a phenomenal outpouring of God. And she came to church <clears throat> and uh, she just said, thank God I'm free. I, I haven't got this feeling of evil all around me anymore. I, I, I dabbled in it, but thank God I'm free from it. But, um, it, it. but she said to my mother, the terrible thing is, it's just almost like this thing's trying to just affect my husband. And my husband is an unbeliever, and, and evil's just trying to get a hold of him. And so my mother said, well, bring him to church. And he didn't want to come to church, and he just got, uh, he just got a terrible sickness. And uh, he just, Satan just with, with, almost immediately just got a hold of his lungs and, and just fill, filled those lungs with cancer. And so he was in a terrible place, and she didn't know what to do and so on. And God said to him, I'm, I'm going to help you. But you just need to fast and pray. You just need to fast and pray. And I will <clears throat> release that power uh, and, and I will get him free. Well, of course, he went to the doctors and found out too late that he had cancer of both lungs. And uh, the, the doctor said, you've got six months to live. Well, she then said, God, I'm fasting, I'm praying and so on. How are you going to do it? He said, well, I will bring my power. You just keep on trusting me. And so my mother would encourage her and so on. But it was a terrible time, just a terrible time for her. But um, what I'm saying is, she was in a situation like this man with his son, where the man was in the where the son was falling into the fire, and then the Bible says here at the bottom of <coughs> bottom of uh, verse fifteen, it says often into the water. In other words, Satan was trying to drown him. He was in a terrible place. He was in a place where he needed God, uh, and so so one, this wonderful man, thank God, met Jesus. So my mother's friend, she just prayed and prayed and prayed and fasted. But like I said to you, fasting begins to gives you power against the devil and gives you power for God to work on your behalf. Thank God for that. Thank God as you begin to do it, you'll feel strong. You know what happens is always at the beginning of anything, when you put God first, it feels terrible. At the beginning of anything, it feels like you can't do it. How am I going to even pray for 15 minutes? Well, you start off with five minutes, then you go to 10, and then you go for 15. Well, I, I used to do that in tongues. 
Many, many times I'd start off praying every single day, 15 minutes, half an hour, sometimes an hour and so on, and then I'd pray more. Then I suddenly found just as easy as anything, I'm praying for three or four, five, sometimes five or six hours a day. Well, my, I, I'm not saying I'm, I'm not doing it in a proud way. I just suddenly found it got so close to God that all of a sudden that fire came on me. It's like someone when they go for my daughter runs all the time. She says the first few minutes are so tough, but then it gets easy, gets much easier. And you just want to do it more and more and more. Uh, and so, so it's the Zakah, the same as God. Even when you fight, first few days and so on, uh, just to so tough, but you break through, you break through. Thank God this woman broke through. She wasn't a very strong Christian, but she knew how to do these things. My mother had encouraged her. My mother had taught her. It's good to have people around you that will teach you and encourage you and help you because a pastor can't do that all the time. So well, <clears throat> she said to the husband, I remember his name, but I won't mention it. She said to the husband, now you come to church with me. Uh, uh, he said, I'm dying. I, I don't want to go to church. She said, what, do you want to die or do you want to go to church? He said, I'll go to church. He walked into the church service. He's standing there, the, uh, the pastor of the church, my pastor, wonderful man of God. This, this man's in the church for a few minutes. He just looks up and he said, Satan's trying to attack your lungs. There's de demons trying to get a hold of your lungs. I command, them to be f I command you to be free right now in the name of Jesus. And as he said that, the power of God came on this man. He got born again, went back to the doctors and was totally healed. See, God's a good God. God's a good God. That came from prayer and fasting. That came from prayer and fasting. So for this man here, he said, Lord, have mercy on my son. He often falls into the water. And it says here, and I brought him to your disciples and they could not cure him. I brought him to the disciples and they could not cure him. Now, this doesn't mean that because Jesus was so powerful, uh, the disciples weren't. God had anointed the disciples already. There was a reason that the disciples couldn't cure him. And we see here right now with Jesus where he says, he says here, then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him here to me. What Jesus is saying is, and it's, it's the same for today, I've given you the power but you still rely on everybody else. You still always, you don't rely on me, God. Yes, it's good to rely on other people. It's good to rely on ministers and so on. But here I've given you the power. Don't be a baby. Get out there and use the power that I've given you. Have faith in me. Trust me that whatever problem you have, I can resolve. And so in a way, in a kind way, he's rebuking the people. Jesus is kind and lovely, but he does rebuke us. And he's saying, don't be faithless. And it's a perverse generation. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him here to me. In other words, I'll do it for you this time, but you need to understand you can do that. Today, it's exactly the same. We're constantly relying on people. We have to phone Susie, to phone Alfred, to phone John, to phone Paul, to see if we can get God's power. You've got it on the inside of you. You can be in the middle of the night right there. You can be by yourself. You can be in the freezing cold, but God's power can come upon you and do all that it needs to do and can destroy the works of Satan and can do and, and, and can bring fire to your bosom and can enable you to strengthen and energize you. You can do it alone. You can sort out the issues because as you, you can get into this word. You can read it by yourself. Yes, of course we need other people. But I want to tell you, as he's saying, you alone can do it. Just have faith in me and I will help you. And so then Jesus, the Bible says, and then Jesus being, being the father, uh, be, being their spiritual father, so to speak, just rebuked the devil and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Jesus got rid of the demons. But then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why couldn't we cast him out? In other words, they didn't say, God forgive us for being faithless, like so many people. There's always a reason. They became the victims. What we often do is say, poor me, I need to be, I'm the victim. God, why didn't that happen? It must be, it's not me, God. It's never me. But what Jesus wanted them to do is to judge themselves and say, you could have actually done that. But you didn't do it because of your disobedience to me. And then verse 20 says here, And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove over to the other place, and it shall remove. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. Nothing shall be impossible unto you. I want you just to meditate on that a second. Nothing is impossible to you. Whatever you need or want to do, the Bible gives you an allowance to do that in God. There's nothing on this earth that is impossible to God. When you walk the way Jesus wants you to walk, nothing can be impossible for your life. I don't care what it is. I don't care whether it's finances. I don't care whether it's health. I don't care whether it's mental issues. I don't care whatever issues it is, relationship issues uh, with family and so on, whatever it is, God can 
do the impossible. God is the God of the impossible. And then Jesus ends up, and I'm going to carry on here next week, and then Jesus ends up and it says, how been, uh, but actually to finish off what I was talking about, this kind goes not out, but by prayer and fasting. This kind goes not out by, by prayer and fasting. What he's saying is here is, is that, of course we pray, but fasting increases the power. Fasting increases the power against evil. Fasting increases the power against the situations we're trying to face in our lives. Fasting takes you on to another level. Fasting will allow you to walk the closest to God you've ever walked. Because if you, if, you, if, if, if you put your flesh under and do what God tells you, His presence will come upon you. You'll be in the spiritual realm in a greater dimension than you've ever been. All of a sudden, you'll be walking on the water, so to speak. You'll feel strong in Him and the power of His mind. And it says what, um, what, God, what Jesus was trying to say. He's not saying you can't cast demons out. What He's saying is here is when you pray and when you fast, it'll give, that'll, that'll increase the power against evil. And bring power to good. And so today, um, I just want to f- finish next week, if you wouldn't mind. I, 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 I just uh, have got just very, very some more important stuff to just go through with you. But I just want to hope, pray that you're blessed. This is much more of a teaching message, uh, and and it's not that you know it's not a jump up and down message, so to speak. But if you get revelation of what I'm saying to you this morning, then great increase will come into your life. I want you to get everything God has for you. I can sit here every week and just preach something that'll make your flesh feel good and that you'll write to me and say that was a great sermon. And, and, and it's always good to be encouraged. But at the end of the day, I want you to get I want you to get the, the, the tools. I want you to get the tools that God has for you. A, 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 a good mechanic has all the tools in his kit. I want you to get all the tools so you can stand against the adversaries and you can stay on top of things. And then all of the other issues in your life will fall by the wayside. The fear, the anxiety, the depression, all those things you've been walking through on a daily basis, you'll suddenly find will just dissipate and fall by the wayside. Thank you so much for watching. I just want to just say to you again, if you wouldn't mind, uh, just remember to subscribe. Also like the video. We now have podcasts which, praise God, I hope you pray you listen to, tell your friends about it. Uh, click on the link below to download any of the past episodes. There's a new episode every week. You can listen anytime you want. And if you could do me a favor right now, right at this moment, if you're not subscribed, please subscribe. And then send this message to anybody in the world that you know. Don't just send them to the people you think would want to hear it. Send them to anybody you know because those people, you don't know where they're at with God. And we don't, we want, we don't want to be a preventative for people coming to God. Like I said to you, there's a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. And if you, haven't, if, you haven't, if you don't know for sure you're born again, if you don't know for sure that you're a child of God, then just repeat after me right now. Just say, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me for my sin. I believe that Jesus, the pastor Martin preached, I believe he's the son of God. I believe he died for me and rose again from the dead. I believe right now that eternity is real and I want to live with Jesus for eternity. Jesus, come and take over my life. I promise you I'm going to serve you. I promise you I'm going to start to read my Bible. I promise you I'm going to start to tell other people about Jesus. I promise you I'm going to change my life to be according to the life he would like me to live. I promise you I'm going to start going to church. I promise you I'm going to give my all to Jesus for the rest of my life and for eternity, because right now I want Jesus to become my Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for taking over my life and becoming my Lord. I believe you're the Son of God, and I thank you for the peace now of the pastor's all understanding that comes into my heart in the name of Jesus. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it.